I'm I'm about 50 50 whether I whether or not I want to participate in a venture capital uh, accelerator program in February. Ooh, okay. Right. So the language of you asking me, you know, what it is, you know, what's it, what's it about? What's the value proposition? You know, what is the compensation structure? All of that really makes sense. Um, but it, it, I was going to say, Alex, it's, it sometimes depends like when you catch me at that particular point, right? If I'm really thinking about, uh, you, you know, Proust or, or something like that, or, you know, Dostoevsky, and then I jump into that, I, I may not have the same, um, you know, the same ability to communicate it. And yeah. as much as I would really like to be able to, um, you know, get it down to a swift elevator pitch, Right. It, it honestly really isn't conveyed that way. Uh, Planksip has been uh, in operation since 2016. And one thing I noticed about the vision uh, was that there was nothing gimmicky or linear about what we what we created as a media outlet. Right. So we already have multiple forms of of income. Uh, we have over 10,000 subscribers in our community. Wow. Um, we only started to monetize the subscribers uh, when COVID hit and we rapidly had to change and adjust it, you know, I mean, but it was a natural, really felt like a natural thing to do. And, and the, the logic behind the monetization was one-on-one um, -on -one relationships with people in content. That was really the fundamental uh, of this, right? So if I, if I approach another academic and I say to them, okay, um, let's produce a video series together, very much like the way you and I are doing, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that wasn't the pretense that I approached you on. But you can imagine that I would approach certain people in certain ways to say, hey, look, let's produce some content together. And that's really, you know, what we've been doing and how the media outlet has actually been able to, um, to develop because you read people's content more, you're developing their content, you're not skimming, you're investing some, you know, real equity of, of time and, and, and creative output together, right? So that was really the foundation of, you know, where we started with, with Planksip. Um, and my, my vision as the founder of Planksip is that I wholeheartedly think that we're on, uh, we've got an idea here that can revolutionize the way media, uh, the way media exists. Okay, cool. The, I like it. And, and so we can go like a few different directions here. One is to go like deep into the sort of like how you would pitch this to investors thing, which we could do. Um, but the other one is to explore some of the other avenues. So I don't know, um, I, we said we were gonna record and then review the recording, but this is super fascinating already. I, I don't sort of wanna, I don't know if this is going to record the way we want it to, though. So part of me is like really conflicted with like, I want to go dig into this. I want to want to check the recording. So good job. You've totally confused me and made me feel like I want to do 12 <laughs> things at once. Um, what do you want to do now? What 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 would seem to be the thing that's mo of most what, interest to you? You know, what? natural um, revealing. OK, so maybe let's talk on both of those two points. Um, so one on the investors, again, I mentioned that I wanted to get involved with an accelerator. Mm -hmm. And the idea with joint venture or, you know, JV Capital Ventures is that you really need to be nicely balanced for an investor. It means you, you need to have, you know, your balance sheets, you need to have your accounting in order, you need to have your value proposition, you need to really show how you scale. And I mean, show they're really looking for that proof of concept. Um, so right now we're sitting at 57 paid members, which has, um, you know, a direct income of $5,700 a month. Now, the model for us in terms of an administration piece was that we only ever wanted to have a maximum of one twelfth of the total revenue. Now, I'm going to get a little bit Greek on you here. So the, in the Hellenic age, the size of a polis or, you know, the Athenian polis was actually 10,000 members. So that's my goal. So I'm not I'm not out to try and create a new app or a new concept on a on a on a dot com that is basically sign up and thousands of 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 um, of members and signups. It's only ten thousand. Yes, it's very expensive relatively compared to what other memberships offer, 
But if they, if people dig into what we're actually offering, it's actually very inexpensive. And the reason why it's inexpensive is because in the content and media creation space, there's not really something reliable for the independent, the individual that wants to create something. I, I, I can put a package together and give it to a company and they're going to be like, yeah, three, $4,000 a month, not a big deal. Even the tenured professor is going to say, I'm not spending three to $4,000 a month on content creation. And by the way, I have to, you know, pay for my own voiceovers. I have to pay for my own this and that and this and this. And this is. So this has a lot more to do with creating meaningful relationships with individuals and leveraging the value of the group to be able to have it, uh, you know, work in that sense. So now with an eye on the prize of the 10,000 member polis, um, basically think, uh, you know, um, Athenians, right? Like the size of the original democracy. So for inspiration, it's really great. There's no misogynistic sort of tendencies here. You know, okay. we're not going to be putting babies on the field to, you know, have them, you know, susceptible to the elements. Well, wait, 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 wait. We're going to talk to investors. Maybe that's what they want though, right? Maybe they'll be like, look, you don't put babies on the field. We're not giving you money, man. Like, yeah, all the ones that have two thumbs, we definitely, yeah, you know, we're, you we're, we're not going to, we're not going to. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about the Greek and Roman history, which is weird because that's my dad's field, right? He He's a professor of Greek and Roman history early Christianity. And when I was nine, he gave me a book called Constantine and Abusus. I'm probably butchering the names. And it was signed by the author. I read the first page. Well, I tried to read the first page. It was half text and the other half footnotes. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, I got three words in and I, I had no idea what it was saying. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm, I'm a little philosophy phobic. I'll, 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 I'll admit that. Um, but I kind of like this idea for like, okay, so you have 57 members now, and then you're yep. looking to grow that to like 10,000. And yep. then it's like a hundred bucks per month. So at 10,000, how does math work? 10,000, a million a month, brother, a million a month. So you got 12 million a year, which is a nice size for a small little business. But like, would it be like, this is Daniel's polis and then someone else could create their own polis. And then that way you have a bunch of these clusters of $12 million and then like maybe you franchise it or something interesting. Yeah. So, so I think the idea is, and that this is partially why I, uh, you know, took the word plank sip and I, um, I, you know, I turned it into a registered trademark, right? So it actually had to do with the organic way of, of propagating, you know, thought concepts and stuff like that. that's a little esoteric and a little bit jargony, but um, basically you're absolutely right. So if we have a 10,000 member plank sip cooperative that's really working, and like I'm saying, I, I really think it, 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 it is the model and a foundation for changing the way media uh, actually is, okay? And I'll, I'll explain why I really think that's the case. But you're right, if that model can then be ported over to other media outlets, and I as the founder say, have at her, mm -hmm. go for mm -hmm. it. Because yeah, it'll yeah. make the bet, it'll, it'll honestly make the world a better place. Now, if if the um, if the idea is is that it's you know licensed or you know from the JV uh, standpoint, sure, I haven't quite worked out those details because I would require or I would lean on, right? Um, I would lean on a lot of the um, the smarts of the the you know the the venture capital group and investors and mentors to be able to say, how should we license this? I mean, I could put so, the equity in. Right. So who's, sorry, JV, who, who is that? Or what is that? Or sorry, I'm thinking uh, venture capital. Sorry. Oh, I, uh, okay. VC, so you probably, yeah. So yeah. you probably want to go of angel first, right? So you want to go okay. like the first, you usually go outside of like friends, family and fools is angel is your first outside investor. So that would make a lot of sense. And then getting into it at this point, you could go probably pitch it straight to an angel group, which would probably work. Or you could go through an accelerator, which could also work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of do both, whatever, just sort of see, you know, if you can get into Y Combinator, of course, that's one of the biggest accelerators in the world, but you know, whatever, wherever you want to go with it. And then it's just a matter of figuring out um, how you want to present this in terms of this 10,000 um, member sort of thing is interesting because it it says like okay, I'm not just going to scale this up and have a million people on this one platform I'm going to have 10,000 on a platform and then it'll be on another platform in terms of sorry when I say platform that's sort of more the user experience but the yeah. underlying technology you you could just like it would be the same basically it would yeah. be like this is we're building so I guess the question is sort of um 
what is it that you've already built in terms of sort of uh, technology, in terms of like software as a service thing? Because that's the thing investors really, really like. Oh, interesting. So what have I developed as software as service? Oh, yeah, you've really opened up a branch here. Um, And I can explain why investors mm. really, really like it. And it all comes down okay. to marginal costs. Your yeah. marginal cost of software as a service is pretty close to zero. So right. if you can go and pick up, you know, 10,000 users and they're paying a hundred bucks a month for it, that's an amazing story. And then if you can go say, well, that's just one community. And then I can go into like Quebec and it's French and all this stuff, but well, the same software works the same. And it's like, okay, great. And then that somebody in Quebec can build sort of a following. I was talking to this guy, Yang Bo Du yesterday, and he's got lots of great contacts in transit and stuff. And so like somebody who does transit stuff, you know, could build a following. And it's kind of like the way I see it, like you maybe have some sort of piece that fits into that infrastructure of like, if I have a sub stack that I create content on and I get people to pay me money there, then maybe what you have is somewhat similar to that, somewhat different. Maybe some people have both plank sip, plank sip sorry, and Substack, like mm. it's an interesting, like how do you fit into that um, kind of content uh, creator ecosystem, right? Okay, yeah. And I think it's the personalized approach. So um, okay. I was I was talking to, who was I talking to the other day where they said the problem with, ah, it was Ian, the guy that's starting uh, along, he's starting the Austin University along with Barry Weiss and oh, okay. Steven Pinker and and I had my podcast wow. last night yeah with with um uh Steve Keen and I said Steve we've got to get in there we've got to yeah. get in and so um if you if you get a chance watch the Lex Friedman episode with um Ian what's his na last name um let me see here Lex Friedman and oh, the suspense is killing me. So I have to admit, I don't even know what this Austin University thing is, but yeah. So it, oh, Neil Ferguson. Okay. And it is, oh, his, yeah, he's written right? some books. Historian. I haven't read any of them, but I probably bought them and not read them. He's married to a, 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 a Hersey, uh, a, um, you know, the uh, uh, a lot. Uh, what's her name? I always what Google is for. The, I just yeah, Google and LinkedIn. That's the only way I remember anything. Yeah. Um, if you get a chance to watch that episode with Lex Friedman, he has okay. him on as a guest, and they talk entirely about the Open University, and it's not intended to be left, right, this type of thing. You have someone like Heather Hein, who you know, along with her husband Brett. I mean, Heather's one of the founding members. Barry Weiss, uh, you know, Ian, Stephen Pinker. Um, there's some big name hitter, heavy hitters on here. And I said to, to, to Steve Keen, I said, look, we got to approach Ian and say that you want to express some interest to be part of that, you know, first year or first, um, they're, they're trying to gear up for 2022, the summer of 2022 to mm -hmm. offer an undergraduate project, um, a program oh, okay. and then even a master's program, but it's intended to be intense. It's intended to be maybe elements of that Socratic sit down where you have your teachers who can really work with you as opposed to, you know, some of these students coming out of Stanford or Oxford, they're saying, I don't really feel after I've got my undergrad degree that I'm really like, what did I get? What did I? Mm. And so uh, the group feels that, that the universities can do something better, especially when there seems to be mounting pressure on, uh, in the on the campuses um, for not being able to say certain things, right? And you know, we can get into whether or not that's a, a really valid or pervasive type of thing. But I guess the point Ian was making is that yeah. if if the seed is there, it actually you know makes people think. And that the universities are the time, especially undergrad, it's a time to be belligerent. It's a time to have the stupid ideas. Yeah, it's the time yeah. to. Lean into stupidity. Wall. That's what you should yeah. do. No, speaking of somebody who pays tuition for somebody going, my daughter goes to university, right? Like the big problem that I see is not necessarily what you can and can't say on university is, am I actually getting any value for this money, right? Yeah. So my daughter goes off and she'll learn some stuff or whatever. And then like, if you, you know, you go to university and you come out of university and you go, now I've got to go find a job. And it's like, well, 
if you didn't actually learn anything terribly useful in university for finding a job, then it's like, what do I pay all this money for? And people will argue, oh, it helps become a better citizen and stuff. And if that's true, why am I paying for it? <laughs> right? And I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, not yeah. exactly like totally left wing in any stuff, like very much I identify a lot of the right wing stuff. But like, I do believe if, you're, if your argument is this is for citizenship, then like, yeah, maybe pay for it out of people's taxes. But then people will say, like, I don't want to pay higher taxes because I don't, I don't care about educating your kid. Right. And so it's this interesting discussion. It's like, OK, because and I think like maybe the big thing is really on the employer side more than the university side. It's like, why do employers require a university degree for a lot of jobs that like it doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense to require a university degree for? Right. Alex, you know, we're getting into some serious, it's a very yeah. interesting things. Yeah. Now, let me kind of like uh, mm -hmm. fire yeah. a bunch of them at your way. Okay. Right. So okay. you're not going to say something to your daughter and say, you know what, let's veer off from a university education because we're not really sure of the outcome. Look, universities, like my father told me, just like traveling, there's, it's going to be valuable regardless. Now, maybe the fact that it, it it's, it's something that is $150,000 and really puts students at a uh, young people at a disadvantage and you know they they come out and they can't afford a house and and really these are the these are the students that are supposed to be our most promising potentials in society right and so i know that one of the things that university had, had taught me among other things i mean i i got a, a tremendous amount of upside in entrepreneurship but the idea is that it teaches you how to learn Right. I mean, it, it really does. It, it, it allows you to assimilate information, uh, approach things in an advanced uh, format, and, and it progresses from, you know, the undergrad to the master's to the PhD. And part of that decision making process to say, how can I find something of value and then offer it back to my. We live in an individualistic society, America more so than Canada, but we are that quintessential social science studies we are the individualistic um, West, right? Mm. And so it really um, is upon our children. It is upon our individual selves to be able to say, here's how I, how I can use my background in an undergraduate you know, philosophy uh, interest and then apply that critical thinking in, in the real world and, you know, or studies in mathematics or you know, however I wanna shape it. Um, and, and, and to deny that would be like, you know, saying that, you know, the educational system is either broken or not valuable. And we know there may be, you know, a difference between the former and the latter, but I mean, I'm just, I'm a proponent of lifelong learning and, you know, and I, and I would imagine you are as well. Right. I mean, I think there's a tremendous I amount of value. I hate the term. I really, really do. Like it? <laughs> it just, it sounds like, it's like saying that there's some other thing you could do, right? Like, what would you do if it wasn't lifelong learning? And that's kind of the problem with high school and university. It's almost like it's got the structure, like you go and you learn, and then you, you, you go and you do. Whereas like, if you actually want to learn stuff, you learn by doing. So you do and you learn and you learn and you do, and you just kind of keep going and iterating. And so like, we actually believe yeah. in lifelong learning. We'd be like, hey, you know, maybe we do what the Swiss do with like, there's, they have these apprenticeship programs at like age, like 12 or whatever. And they do that for like how many ever years and they do a couple of them. So you actually get sort of hands-on sort of experience doing stuff. And you're like, yeah, this is for me or for not, or not. But I think like, I guess going back to your original thing was there was one of these people involved in this open university who you were talking to about um, what you've built with PlankSip and some of the technology there. Or did I sort of miss the? I, I haven't pitched them yet. Uh, okay. what, what we what we would say is that that's that circle of um, you know in the interview with Lex Friedman he said hey I just want everybody to know this isn't just like uh, a faculty of the inter uh, of the intellectual dark web right this is not what it is <laughs> even a though he's saying that's what it is right it, it, even though he's welcoming like he asked. Harris, he said, if you're listening, Sam, we really appreciate, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. some of these outlier thinkers that were saying, come on, be a part of this. Uh, Brett um, Weinstein and Heather Hang, they were ousted from yeah, you get, Green. Uh, you you got to get Jordan, Jordan Pearson in here, obviously, like that's, you know. Well, he's part of that group anyways. Yeah, so yeah. if you had Brett Weinstein in that ecosystem, right, he's not, he can have a, a a rational conversation with Jordan Peterson and did within the last yeah, few okay. months, I think. Right, right? Cool, cool. So he can talk about it from an evolutionary standpoint, but the more I 
you know, um, I, I look at Jordan Peterson, he's somebody that could also fit into that sort of category. Um, it may be a little bit more on the fringe in terms of blending some sort of psych psychology class with something theological. I don't, I don't know, but these are questions about cultural identity that are making us scratch our heads. And I tell you, that is a very cutting edge, um, uh, I guess, like topic in social science right now, like how pervasive and um, deterministic is cultural evolution? This is kind of the idea. Wow. Like, wow, wow. That, you're, you're out that, in Vancouver, right? Uh, Joseph Heinrich is there somewhere. And that's his stuff with like, you know, the secret of our success and the weirdest people in the world. Like it's a lot of that cultural evolution stuff. Which I find fascinating, which because a lot of times people talk about evolution and they sort of mix in the like physical evolution of like our bodies with the cultural stuff. And it gets all weird and, you know, confusing. But like he did a great job of sort of like explaining, like he has this example. I don't know if you read the book where there's these, um, you know, they're always British or European explorers who end up going somewhere like the high Arctic. And then they, you know, they get stranded and they're going to die. But they find, you know, the Inuit find them and take them in and then teach them how to live. And it's like, it really challenges this notion that like, you know, your big brain sort of British, you know, philosophers or explorers or whatever could just figure things out. Like it's actual culture, actually cultural evolution that figured out how do you live in the high Arctic? And like, you can't just like Google it or whatever, because you need, um, and Verveke talks about it this way, you need actual like participatory knowledge. You need like hands-on skills of doing something. It, well, I guess that's more of the procedural, but whatever. You need to like, not just have the, like theoretical knowledge, you need to know like, okay, if I'm out there in the high Arctic, what do I need to do to get like drinking water? And there's the whole thing he has in the book where you got to go through like how you do that and how you look for the type of ice and it's like slightly different color and this, that, and the other. And like, you can do that. And then you have to like, you know, find some, you know, I don't know, you have to kill some whales or something to get blubber to burn oil. It's like, there's like 50 steps in there to do it. Right. But it's not like these people are sitting down with like, you know, um, ISO standards and stuff and going exactly, through and yeah. following standard operating procedures. It's just cultural evolution, which I find so fascinating because in the business world, there's so much of the standard operating procedures and ISO and this, that, and the other. And it's like almost like making us dumber. It's like, why yeah. not just come up with something that actually makes sense to people instead of like trying to train people and doing things that don't make sense to them? How are you, how are you situated with... Uh, uh... Uh, Nassim Taleb's thoughts um, on like, you know, bashing the bell curve and, and uh, anti-fragility and stuff like that. I like the anti-fragility stuff. I haven't heard any of the bashing the bell curve. I really, really like um, his concepts. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm not on Facebook is because of him. And then I just bug every single person in EA, effective altruism, who wants to post something on Facebook. Like I run a effective altruism mental health group and there's an effective altruism mental on a Slack, and there's a there's one on Facebook. And I'm thinking like that they are sort of missing the point. Like if you're running a mental health group on Facebook, you probably should just close up shop, right? It's like having, you know, we're gonna have our vegan meeting in a butcher shop, right? It's like, oh, what, like what, what's all this stuff around us? Like, I don't know. Like, you know, nothing against Facebook or meta or whatever they call now, but like they may be bad for mental health. That's fine, whatever. They they do them. But like, you know, if you're part of this, like you're like, hey, we want to do mental health. It's like, yeah, get on a platform that's maybe slightly better for people's mental health. So yeah, so and the only reason I I, I came across that sort of way of looking at it was because of uh, Nicholas Nassim Talib's um sort of I don't know how to say it, ergodosicity or something, or the thing with the, the kosher lemonade. Mm -hmm. So he's got this whole story about like all the lemonade you can buy in North America is kosher apparently. And it's that way because it's just as cheap to make it not kosher or kosher. And so there's like some small part of somewhere that like, you know, one little neighborhood where they just demanded they absolutely had to have kosher lemonade. And, you know, once that started happening as well, since they sell it in that neighborhood, they might as well sell it in the greater area and then the whole state. And then next thing you know, the whole of the US and the Canada has kosher lemonade or something. So goes his theory. I don't know if that's actually true though. It might be completely not true, but I do like the sort of concept that it's like the, um, you know, sort of the, the minority can like be really, really uh, just instringent and adamant and get the majority to change their opinion just because the majority doesn't care. 
And so that's mm -hmm. my attempt within effective altruism to be like, yeah, I am not using Facebook. If you're doing something, don't put it on Facebook, put it somewhere else. Or if you're doing it on Facebook, also put it somewhere else. And it got so funny that there was an event for something at Oxford University through effective altruism, because that's where like big altruism is, is in Oxford University. And they had an event and it was on Facebook. It was the only place it was on. And somebody eventually sent me a link to something. And then I watched it and I tuned in literally at the minute when they're talking about social media and these, all these smart professors, great, you know, genius guys, whatever, and, and, and females too, I think, they were talking about how social media was bad. And then they talked about how we shouldn't do as much thing, as many things on Facebook. And there it is, broadcasting and I was like, on Facebook, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, wait, so the people organizing this thing don't talk to the people doing that? Like this, this disconnect between the propositional and the procedural and the perspectival and the participatory, whatever Vakey Vakey says, that guy's amazing. The Toronto Wisdom Conference, AKA Verveki Palooza is gonna be incredible. I would love to get in there with Verveki and I think I have a contribution because I think yeah. he's, the last uh, video that I've watched of his is that he's, um, he's really developing his intellectual thought around Plato and I'm a platonic philosopher and um, I don't go. apologize about it because um, I, I, I think so much returns to the platonic thought. And if somebody's simple categorization of platonic thought is that it ultimately leads to an ideological, uh, you, you know, everything that's emerged ideologically, right? I mean, cause it's so pervasive. It, it's, I, I, think, I think the man, um, you know, rightfully deserves all of those footnotes that, that Whitehead, um, you know, pointed out. So, um, I, 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 I would, I would love to do a series with him, right? I think yeah. he, he would be great, or at least to have on our show because, um, you know, Vervecki's, uh, I think a really, really nice contender and counterpoint to the, uh, to the wisdom that's emerging out of, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, they did. I don't know if you saw it, they did an event together and it was like, this is, it was like supposed to be so intense. It was psychedelic or the name of it, whatever. And it was good. Peterson maybe interrupted Ricky a little bit too much, but and so it sort of distracted from it. But it was really, really, it really did something fascinating. It was really interesting to see the two. They, you know, they're both at the University of Toronto, so they know each other and stuff like that. And they, they have, it seemed like they have a very friendly, you know, sort of rapport. And it was just, just, a, just a really, really interesting thing. I did find though I needed to like pause like constantly to, um, uh, basically find out what the heck they were talking about um, because like I hadn't watched Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and so there a lot of the stuff went over my head but um, yeah there's a lot there there's a lot to dig into a lot to make sense of and a lot to really kind of connect and sort of ground us to not just like this is a bunch of theory but this is a bunch of like practical real world stuff and I really like the technique of like being able to move between the abstract to the particular and one of the ways I find that works really really well is things like metaphors Right. So I was at this complexity weekend thing. I did my talk on you know, my facilitation on stupidity, which you know, worked really, really well. And then I helped somebody and she was doing sort of nature metaphors. So I was trying to work with her to come up with metaphors for all these natural things, um, which was which was interesting. I kept going to things like Tesla's and driving and cars, but like that, you know, nature doesn't work quite that way. So I was like, oh, well, what do you have in nature that's like this? And like, oh, you have, you know, you know animals have some, some of them have wings or whatever. So, okay, that's, a, you know, flying and hovering above and being able to sort of see from a different perspective. That's, that's cool. Um, and there was something, somebody there like had this, this metaphor of a, the tip of the spear, which is like a, you know, a metaphor from sort of, you know, the military or the, you know, that sort of, and it was like, okay, so how do you translate that metaphor from that domain to a similar context in like a, a sort of a biomimicry domain? And she suggested, this idea of like a pioneer species. And so one thing that would be really, really fascinating is to develop the skill of being able to use different metaphors from different domains. And then when you go out to talk to people, if you're talking to a platonic philosopher, there's probably a concept that Plato had or someone near Plato had about this idea of sort of the, you know, the tip of the spear, the, you know, pioneer species, the very like, you know, the very first, you know, sort of, you know, the zero to one kind of thing, like who's your first customer, like all these sorts of things. They're not like necessarily new, but it's like, how do you say them in a way that like connects 
you know, with, with somebody and it's meaningful to them. And I think there's probably a lot there that could be done. Um, I thinking, um, Michaela M is her name. I think she would be amazing to have on this show to, to talk about biomimicry and stuff she's, she's been doing. She's actually like an airplane pilot and then does all this other amazing stuff. It's just a fascinating combination of, of skills. Um, yeah, but I think there's, um, just, there's just so many, um, opportunities to like take these things in different ways. Like the biological, um, metaphor is great for like, um, I was working with this guy about uh, crypto as applied complexity. And then I came up with like, if you just sort of like, um, abbreviate or take some of those letters out, it's, you know, CR from crypto, AP from applied and CO from complexity and it's crap co. And it's perfect because crypto is crap is something I want to talk about with people. And, but yeah, when I say it, when you say it, it's like, oh, crypto is crap, but not in the way you think, because yeah, like yeah. people think crypto is just dumb and stupid, but it's actually crap in terms of it's like fertilizer. It makes things grow. And it makes like, if you do it right, you can build on top of this Ethereum virtual machine and you can make yeah. just some amazing, amazing things out there that like you can use web services. And for a web service, you have to like authenticate and get payment and stuff like that. And it's complicated. But if you build on something like an Ethereum virtual machine, you could actually just have somebody send you a web request with payment. And then you just like send them back whatever it is they asked for. Just like going to a store and you go and you take cash and you give them cash and give you what you want. Essentially, you can set that up with the Ethereum virtual machine with smart contracts and stuff like that. So we should probably have some people. Did you on know that? Did yeah. you know that I have a, a company called BD Consulting? It's a consulting company specializing in big data for construction or AEC space, architectural engineering and construction. Okay. So I was a, uh, I am still um, a Matillion reseller and um, I've done several projects where we're taking databases and putting them on AWS or Snowflake and, and that wow. type of thing. Yeah, yeah. We could pitch that to investors. Well, I, 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 what's, what is it? I always think I have to do like the left, right sort of thing. Bearish, bullish. No. Okay. So yeah. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm bearish on that. And the reason is, is because um, as the consultant, I don't have any of the software myself, right? I've got the expertise. I can hire people. We can scale, but what is the, I don't have anything proprietary that's mine. And so in the architectural space, there is, say, for example, like this, they, their slogan is the science aware, and this is Esri, being able to geolocate things, um, you know, in, in space, right? And it's really important for, for construction in the architectural industry, right? So that's Esri. Now, they have a product. Now, I can be a certified Esri partner, right? And I mm -hmm. can offer that, but just like a certified Micros, Microsoft provider, how am I... How am I taking that and scaling that other than we can say, this is the dream team. And now you want to buy it because we're the most amazing management group, but it's still not my technology. Right. right. So here, here's an idea. There's this thing I just put in the chat, 3D cityscapes. So I saw these guys I went to Angel Investors Ontario, the Toronto Economic Forum. These guys were there and they're doing digital twins of full cities. And they're built on top of the Unreal Engine, which is what Fortnite's amazing. built on. Yeah. Like so that. then if you just think of like, okay, they're building these digital twins. What can I build on top of that? You could maybe be the guy who makes coffee shops or, mm. you know, philosophical coffee shops. You know, you can work with Peter yeah. Lindbergh here of the Stoa in Toronto, right? That's his dream. You could make those in 3D virtual space. You could actually make them in reality too. And then they'd be a digital twin. And that could be the thing you take out to the world. And then you're like, hey, I've got this philosophical coffee shop. It's in reality it's in virtual reality as well on this 3d cityscapes and oh by the way you can have up to ten thousand people who are members of my virtual coffee shop and that's plank sip yeah let me share this with you because it was it was funny you'd asked if i had any technology and i do but it's not directly related to the subscription service it's just more corporate initiatives and and yeah. I'll, I'll share my screen in a minute but what i what i want to actually point out is that uh just top line what some of the some of the projects were so one of them is called the gadfly and it's um uh it's it's a listening app and so it's it's just like a where's my what you think it's just something you put on your ear you listen you can answer your phone this kind of thing i listen the idea came to me because i had i listened to so many audiobooks mm -hmm. right so you know you can't always flip a book open and 
and, and read it. But, you know, you can always kind of have a book running and go to the grocery store or go do your chores or do whatever. And you can kind of make your way through a book pretty quickly, right? Oh, Just yeah. turning it on, uh, uh, on the audiobooks, right? And I think I have like 700 audiobooks in my Audible account, right? So, oh. I, you know, I'm well listened. <laughs> there you go. Yes, that's the thing these days. Yes. But the I need to remake that that movie, Bad Teacher. And because she said movies are the new books. Like if you were the bad yeah. teacher, we just dress you up as Carmen Diaz, whatever, put a wig on you. You look great, whatever. And then you can be like, hey, yeah, kids, no audio. That's the new books. And the kids would just sit there and they'd listen to it. You know, that'd be well, amazing. Really You'd is. revolutionize the school system. It really is. I think that there's too much like in the in the audiovisual space. I think there's so much focus put on the visual and yeah. our visual consumption yeah, yeah that it's amazing how much can actually come even primordial through the the audible the the, the uh yeah yeah Mar marshall McLuhan's hot media right the difference between yeah. hot and cold is the hot is actually just like the one channel the mm -hmm. like just hear, hearing it i went to this thing alex danko did this interintellect thing and he went into the Marshall McLuhan, the Claude Shannon stuff. And I didn't, I hadn't really understood it before, but he did an amazing job of like kind of going through the stuff. Um, he would be a great person to have on a show, but like probably notoriously hard to like, you know, get booked and stuff like that. Cause like, he's probably a little busy. You know what? I, I think with our project, let's just take it easy. If we don't get them, yeah. we can still talk about them. Yeah, right? I, absolutely. I'm not going to stress about, you know, the fact that, you know, we asked Donald Trump and he doesn't, you know. No, respond. he didn't. No, oh. I haven't asked yet, but I mean, and yeah. I'm thinking, what is the way to ask him, right? I mean, I guess it just he doesn't have a Twitter I, account anymore. I was, yeah, I was gonna say Twitter, but I, I guess that's not there anymore. So maybe you have to use wh whatever that other one is. Um, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I don't but know. What's the sort of the thing you were saying with the audio? So it's like yeah. a, yeah. So it's it's um so it's, it's a you you need to have the device on your ear to be able to have it listen to you. So think of um like a Lexus or. All right. of these kinds of things. The issue from a computer programming standpoint is they're very command orientated. Um, you know, what's the weather like? What's this like? What's that? Right, so right. it's not so much associative, in, except the, the machine learning algorithms behind them are very associative. If you look at uh, the drop down menu that comes from uh, a, a Google search bar, um, this I believe is called the a priori uh, uh, algorithm, right? Okay. And so what happens is, is that when I read and um, anybody reads, especially if you start to read prolific, uh, prolifically. A lot. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck, it's easier to say that. <laughs> so when you read a lot and your, 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 your library is growing, it's like you want to be able to recall information really quickly, right? Okay. And so that's what the app was designed to do because if, if I'm in a situation where I'm trying to either in a group or um, just trying to write an essay, and mm -hmm. a lot of times you'll hear me writing an essay, I'll be saying stuff out loud. It's a way of trying to actually um, uh, to edit, edit what I'm saying, right? Oh, wow. I mean, okay, yeah. Good on paper, but I'll have to, you know, either rehearse it in my head, sometimes I'll say it out loud that really helps from, you know, from the, you know, the development of the language, right? And so yeah. there, the writer is able to get certain intonations that they're not able to do. Now, the, the value of that particular writing is not always realized, especially if someone's just skimming. But that was one of the points of Planksip to have them slow down and spend more time in the creative process and therefore in, in, in the experience itself. But anyways, getting back to the idea of the of, of the um, audible cues and the reminders, there's something that's called the uh, cocktail effect. OK, and so the easiest way to describe that is imagine you're in a cafe and you can attenuate and listen to the person behind you, possibly the group, uh, you know, on the, you know, two tables over. Um, you can attenuate your, your listening into certain things. Right. And so it's a skill that I've been able to develop and I can hear um, I can hear things, uh, you know, listen to a book and still do other activities. And in fact, it's how I, I, you know, I've, I've done experiments to try and see, you know, how I can multitask with a few. So are you listening on, to a right? book right now? No, I knew you were going to ask me that. Yeah. See, okay. There you go. A priori is working. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, but the idea was that I, I, I put, I started to put it up on GitHub. 
And I just, it's one of those projects I haven't, I mean, I've got the concept down. I just have to find some time to be able to get uh, a group of talented coders together. And if I do any kind of app development, my issue yeah. is, is that it has to be rock solid. It can't run out and say, well, we'll iterate it. It has to be rock solid because it could be the death of it right away. It's not like, oh, we oh, fixed that. So right? there's you a right to... way to do this, right? And yeah. that's to go really, really narrow and find sp- solve a really specific problem. Because the problem I see a lot of people come to um, angel investment groups and pitch is their thing is a bit too generic, a bit too like we're trying to do too much versus if you go really, really narrow and pick a really specific thing you're solving and then do that, you can do that really, really well. And then when you iterate, you're slowly expanding. You're saying like, we solved this really, really specific problem. Now we're going to solve something a little further out and a little further out. Okay, so here's how I would scaffold it. And I'll put it mm-hmm. into your situation. You've got yeah. a certain amount of books and thinkers that you go to on a regular basis. Okay, so they're going to have, they're going to have, um, if, you, if, if you listed your top uh, seven to 25 thinkers, and I'll give you an example, because I've already, I did this for a professor at a UBC. His name is Professor Tubinek, Stephen Tubinek. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I have the permission to share. Oh, you got to give me the oh, sure, access yeah. here. All right, let's do this. Okay, so. You should have access now. Okay. Yes. You said you were going to share something and then, yeah. Okay. So here's, here's what we're looking at. It's a, um, mm. it's assignments for Stephen Tobinek. Okay. Right. And so he didn't actually do the, the assignments, but there were members that were joining PlankSip. And what I had them do is give me a list of their seven to 25 thinkers. Um, now what happened is I ended up with something like this on a spreadsheet, right? So basically there's their thinkers. And wow. you have the number of instances per author as right. we run them through um, a Google algorithm. Basically, the algorithm generates from the schema.org of a, of, a, of a Google page, right? And so it's really the people also search for um, uh, data that, that shows up, right, on the, on the, on the schema of uh, okay. a search page, right? right. I'll, I'll right. actually show you where that is. So if I were to put in... Max Planck, and I'll move that over here in a second. One of the namesakes for um, for Planksep, you'll notice that you've got down here, you've got people also search for. Oh, okay, there you are. Yeah, right. So it's this re- it's this relational database that I find really called off and against um, uh, books. So the index of the books will list all sorts of things, right? From people, places, things, all these kinds of things. And there's a lot of false positives on the index analysis when you look at things uh, like definitions. But there's not a lot of variance when you look at somebody like Albert Einstein, right? We know that if Albert Einstein shows up in the index of the book, we pretty much know that that's who it is, right? So it's, it's, it's it's, it's very accurate. And then what we... At here is um, okay. Now we've done a nodal analysis Ooh, here, okay. right? And so I can't recall the name of the program we're using, but we have a nodal analysis here to see where it groups and how this, these networks form. So this is a particularly interest here because it's very isolated. I'm mm. not sure who that was. Maybe it's uh, I, I just can't uh you know uh zoom in on it right here mm-hmm. but yeah yeah you know you've got all of these people that represent uh mr tubin x or professor tubin x um favorite okay how do i turn off the share now here mm-hmm. um that that represent his famous thinkers his go-to thinkers can help show some of the blind spots because the benchmark or the control that you're comparing it against is actually the um, you know, the passive filter, which is, you know, it's not personalized. It's like when someone looks for Albert Einstein, they also, people are also looking for Max Planck or Schrodinger or blah, 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 right? So it's that okay. right mixture of all the kind of people that you're looking for, both contemporary and ancient or, you know, people that, you know, have passed away or famous intellectuals of our past. And yeah. that, you know, so who, somebody, sorry, who, who would use this? Like, who's the sort of, target user it's internal this. really at this point so it adds to the value of the company in fact and so what it was is from a from a philosophy standpoint it was a way to objectively um 
it's like a, a an objective ontology, right? So say, for example, I decided to do a content creation strategy on Planksit for all of Planksit. Okay. Someone would say, well, how did you choose that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one? Well, very simply, what I did is I went to, you know, some of the most influential thinkers or went to this list, this list, and this list, ran it through the filter, and this is what populated. And they're going to say, okay. oh, okay, that's interesting. So I can see why you have Alice, um, why you have um, Marilyn Monroe, why you have uh, Mal, why you have Hitler on your site. I understand why that's there. It's not me saying that I'm, you know, a Nazi or, a, you know, a authoritarian sort of nut, nutball, but that's why they're on there. It's, it's amazing you I, give Marilyn Monroe a pass. Exactly. But here's the thing. I, I, what I say is that it's not, it's because that's what the people, that's what our zeitgeist, that's what our culture yeah, is yeah. actually serving up. That's so a it's, weird combination. That's Marilyn right. Marilyn Monroe, Mao, and Hitler are not three people I'd assume, you know, you would come together in a way. But I guess based on your analysis, that might be what pops out just because that's kind of what people search for when they look for, I don't know, Einstein or something, or I don't quite. Well, know. I'm, we're, Probably we're doing a little bit more Kennedy? of a spotlight, yeah. but while we're doing this, why don't you just open up planksip.org and on the second piece, on the second uh, menu bar all over, it's giants. And you can see that there's probably about 200 intellectuals on there from George Bernard Shaw to Plato, Aristotle, all these, those are the people. So it's it, the fact that I just gave an example, Marilyn Monroe, Hitler and, and, and Mao, they really don't have anything in common per se, but the only way we can see the relationships is when, you know, yourself, you give me a list of your famous and how they're clustering, right? And you know, if you went through that and you're like, oh, that's really interesting that Mark Twain's in there. And most of the people that look up Mark Twain are also looking up, um, you know, this particular, like say Kafka. And you'd be like, I never have ever picked up anything other than no, other than that I know that he wrote Metamorphosis, right? And you might think, right. oh, maybe I really should because there's, you know, there's a lot of people who are looking for at Twain, at Mark Twain, who also are looking at, at Kafka, right? And- okay. So that was valuable for anybody to give them um, uh, like a, a nodal vi visual representation of, of, of their so knowledge. I have got an interesting idea for you as a, as a interesting creative challenge. Can you do anti-matching? So okay, just I think right anti-matching is a great idea for, for fostering creativity. And like, let's say you put in Mark Twain, which author is least like Mark Twain? And then say, okay, now as a creative writing challenge, write something combining Mark Twain and that author that's least like them. I have no idea what least like Mark Twain would actually look like, but let's say for sake of argument, it's, you know, um, Jane Austen or something, or actually somebody more contemporary. Who's a contemporary author? But, I don't know. But, but Margaret the, Atwood a, or something. I think, I think so, but I think there's a problem with the least likely. And the, and the reason is, is that we, we never want to emphasize the, the relationships of this, of this network, right? It's very, it, it's, um, the, the, the reason is, is that um, there's virtually no causal relationship to the, to the image and, and the structure that you're looking at, virtually zero. Okay. But if you were to look at, say, your best friend, okay, and you were to see this was his, no, his, his network, right? Yeah. And I was to look at yours, then I'd have a good understanding of where your cultural lineage is from. And so, so oh. Brett Weinstein talks about this a little bit, and I've totally adopted the idea of lineage when it comes to kin-based theories of cultural evolution versus, uh, or I would say the two competing theories, right? And the okay. most talked about are kin-based um, theories of, of cultural evolution and group selection, okay? Okay. And as, you know, somebody that comes, uh, you know, the, the altruism groups, I mean, this is totally in that, in that sort of category, right? I mean, it, it's, it's totally about cultural evolution because right, altruism right. plays such an important role in that, right? So <clears throat> what Brett is talking about is he's saying both of those theories are incorrect, which is the kin-based and the group selection theories, okay? Oh, okay? He views it more as a lineage. And the lineage theory means that it is... Um, uh, more susceptible or 
to, well, to, the, to the evolutionary pressures, right? And as an evolutionary biologist, that's what he's seeing. And it completely makes sense to me. So that it's not just about what a group wants. It's not just about what um, uh, a family would want. There's the information and the transmission happens across uh, generations. Okay, now going back to the earlier part of the conversation, um, when we were talking about universities, one of the founding principles and concepts behind that, that Austin University um, was the fact that, guys, we, did, we go back to the, this is the idea of an academy is something that was prevalent with, with Plato. Okay, so this, this, this is, is the substrate, the first principles for us being able to transfer information from older generations to younger generations. Okay, and it transcends this left right conversation. It transcends, um, it, uh, I guess, uh, you know, things like that emerged from the French Revolution or the Second World War. Universities are so fundamental, uh, you know, to our, to our society. This is our most reliable means Ooh. and mechanism to transfer information to the younger generation. The weird right? thing, though, is the younger generation is now transferring information to the older generation, right? Like, if you well, wanted to learn about TikTok, you're not asking somebody no. <laughs> old, right? Well, I, I have a perfect answer to that. It, and and the th is that one of the things that they recognize, like, you don't become a better physics student or math student in your 30s. There is a peak in terms of your intellectual capability when it comes to like raw thinking power uh, mm. is, is mathematically it's in your 20s, okay? Sure, sure. So what happens is that the older generation has more of that experience, fair enough. But if you wanna really tap into some you know, brilliant minds, they're, you know, they're the younger minds. And that's, that's you know, kind of just the, the way our species is designed, right? So. Huh. Um, if, if we were to say younger generation teaches us, absolutely, absolutely. But that's why we need them to go to university so that they go for far in debt so that they're now trapped in <laughs> oh, that Oh, we're cycle, leaning into right? the stupidity here again. Yeah, yeah, but you know yeah. what I mean, right? It's like, you need to go to university because <laughs> we're threatened by your genius, you, you smart kids. And some of them who are like, you know, too stupid to realize they shouldn't do this are like, you know, the wealthiest people in the world who like drop out of university, go found a company and it goes amazing. And part of that might be there's a whole lot of people who drop out of university and had startups that just sucked and they're like living in poverty. Like there's maybe a, a mirror Bill Gates and a mirror Mark Zuckerberg out there, but I don't know. Nobody's actually bothered to do any sort of study as far as I know. Well, I should say I've never bothered to look for any sort of study that anybody's done. It's probably there. I've just never bothered to look. Um, but I think that yeah, this, this is like fascinating in that you can like create a platform that helps people sort of see these lineages and stuff. I'm more interested in like busting that sort of stuff up and doing dumb things like finding the least <laughs> likely and then making people do a creative writing exercise to say like, here's a passage from Mark Twain. Here's a passage from like Margaret Atwood, you know, explain the similarities and differences. And then you as a writer are like, Holy crap. Like these are to totally different writing styles. There's nothing in common, but there is because they're both talking about the human experience, right? Like if Mark Twain writes something about, I don't know, whatever it was like in, where is he from? Somewhere in the States, right? I don't know, like 150 years ago. And then Margaret Atwood wrote something about the future Gideon, whatever, whatever, that, that Handmaid's Tale or whatever thing that we had to write, read in, in high yeah, school. That yeah, yeah, yeah. and so if you if you make people like if you just throw stuff at them that's like totally unpredictable and weird they're like what how do i make sense of it it's like yeah you you're a writer you have to just make sense of crazy nonsense because that's what the world is it's crazy nonsense it doesn't make any sense well there the thing is is that there is low-hanging fruit in this um i would say like when you get your results back you're like i've never looked at that person and the, the, the structure that we have for the writer cooperative, which as a fellow Canadian, we're not completely at, you know, scared of, of, of a, of, of a co-op. That is the idea is that, you know, there's people that join this cooperative and they compete for uh, cash prizes. Okay. Yeah. And so we have yeah. prizes every, any, uh, ranging from 500 to $8,000. Okay. Per nice, article. Nice. Yeah. And so it's a dollar a word basically. So 500 word piece versus, and you're responding to quotes. 
So when somebody joins, if they go through that program and they want to participate in what I call the free for all, it's the our free form association, the FFA, then basically they get their personalized 52, week, uh, 52 writing assignments. And it's kind of like that. They're mm. like, I had no, I have not written about this. I haven't written about this quote. I've never read this. It's up for, to them to go in and, and explore that. And then it's, it's editorial work that, that, that Planksip as an entity benefits from. And ontological structure, it allows me to compare nodes of your creativity with someone else's creativity. So for example, if we take Mark Tank Twain's quote on lying and I ask you for 500 words and I ask you know, Sally for 500 words, then I can compare the two nodes between the two. And the power of the peer reviewed competition is that you're voting against the other people in your cohort. So let's say there's 24 and it's a thousand dollar competition. That means if, if you're voted as the best work, it's not my editorial board, it's your peers that have said, Alex was the best, you know, 500 or sort of thousand word response. And, you know, here's your thousand bucks. So that's how I want to revolutionize the, the you know, revolutionizing the, the media outlet. The main thrust that we're doing that is the fact that mm. I think people eventually will be tired of being fans with nothing to do. Yes. Okay, if I like Steven Pinker, okay, which I do, I've read all his books. He has a new one out, by the way. I've read all of his books. I've studied all of his books. I love all of his books. Sure, he responds to me one sentence here and there. I've had probably a several do a dozen conversations with him over a number of years. Um, but I can't really engage with him. And so the last thing that I want to do is just be a fan. Yeah. And I yes. think people are going to be tired of just being so a fan. So you're talking about something we could call not only fans. Yes, that could be a great there it's, you go. We're not only I'm, fans. Exactly. Are, I'm sure you won't run into any copyright problems with that slogan <laughs> yeah. or give anybody the wrong impression. But it's that I'm not just a fan. I don't just want to be a consumer. I also want to be a producer. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that was that was the main thrust behind the co-creation strategy is to say that you may not be and I mean you in general, whoever is the person listening, you may not be at the status of Steven Pinker. Chances are you're not. Or Nassim Taleb or, you know, Jordan Peterson. But you got to have a starting point. And mm -hmm. it's, I don't want to create another a shift to a worship culture, right? Yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, the idea is, is that people should be able to network and take some of these sure. ideas and bring some of their own and build their own, so it sounds so right? what I what I'm seeing in this is there is a model out there for building a startup, right? And it's you can go and you can research, you talk to people, whatever, you can figure it out. Is there a model out there for becoming a writer that this ties into, right? Because becoming a good writer, you need to write and then you need to get feedback. It's like anything, like becoming yeah. a surgeon, you need to do surgeries and like have somebody say, Yeah, the patient's alive or not, right? Like, you know, it's yeah, kind of like an, an internship. Part. Like they 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 have to have yeah. a residency. And yeah, that's and, what we offer is that yeah. we are uh, an internship entity. without getting the coffee. You actually do interning, not just like menial tasks. Exactly. And yes. and they say, well, okay, so if I write this article, will you pay me for it? And I go, well, if you're submitting it to the competition, how many people are in the competition? And you have a one in one in 12, one in, it's all multiples of 12. So one in 12, 24, 36, 48, all the way up to 192. That's our biggest cash prize. It's $8,000 cash prize. So I don't know, you write it, submit it. And when it goes into competition, yeah. then your and peers will tell you if you get paid, not me. And do you, so other than winning or not winning, do you get any feedback on what you wrote? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. it's, yeah. And so, you know, you're going to, if you're good, like say there's 192 submissions, you have to review 11 other papers, right? And so you read them, you vote them, you yourself, if you had submitted, you're going to have to, one of the, one of the conditions is you're going to have to read 11 other papers. Okay. Wait, then what if there's only like 12? Let's start with the one I'll, I'll understand. So if there's 12 people. All right. How many would I just review one other or how does that work? Uh, 11 of them, always, whether it's 12 oh, or 192. Okay, right? okay so, so we've had 12. to put in a limit, yeah. So I write my piece of crap thing, 100, is that the 50, you know, 500 word thing? I yeah, write 500 exactly. words of crap, I hand it in, I review 11 others and I go, these are all terrible, obviously. Mine was and amazing. mine's the best, yeah, yeah. 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 So and then everyone get... else does the same. So how do you figure out whose is 
the best. You get two. Hour. You get two votes. So okay. conceivably, most you, you know, you would say you could um, vote for yourself. Okay. Uh, but you have to vote for one other person, and then what you have okay. is two votes. You could stack your vote. You could say, "I'm going to give my two votes to this person and that oh, person." We need to do quadratic voting here. Exactly. So what you should get is like four vote credits which you could use for two votes stacked votes because two squared is four or you can use as four separate votes yeah that's the way quadratic voting works. and then that way you incentivize people actually spread out their votes and not just cluster them right okay so that's an improvement which i could easily put it that's a great idea actually yeah. i really like that yeah. and yeah. uh it sounds really smart it is Glenn wild voting. came up with it not me <laughs> radical exchange it's their thing quadratic voting but like they have a conference to december 10th yeah so you have this this um you know this voting mechanism and that's who determines it's your mm. peers who determine it so it's not like you take this idea of peer review and it's not we're trying to be critical we're trying to say i actually really like that article um and there's a oh. lot of right and so, so so here here's an idea so if you had cohorts and they're like 12 and like some people win but you could have all 12 of them create material and publish that as a group. And then that could go out and you could have something where like, so we're competing to sort of be the best within this, but we're also cooperating to improve each other's writing. And then now when we grow up and if you have different cohorts, cause you have the 192, which is like a multiple, well, 144 would be 12 multiples of 12. Let's just use that cause it's simple. If you had that, then of those 12, if they created a compendium and they all wrote something together, and now they're you're sort of doing that at that scale where they're reviewing other compendiums and same sort of voting thing, then it's like this group of 12 wins a prize and then gets shared somehow, whatever that would be. That would be fascinating because yeah. I love the idea of combining both competition and cooperation together in yeah. useful ways because the competition does drive you to want to improve personally but the collaboration helps build a good community where it's not always just about beating people. It's also about like helping people improve because if you as a group of 12 have one person who sucks and you can help them improve, maybe you can win the whole, that, that thing. Yeah. That's sort of no, like, no, I, I, I yeah. completely agree. And that's absolutely uh, the way we've envisioned it. The, oh, the one amazing. on, um, on the free for all, or we we call it the uh, the free form associative one, is individual. Yeah. But the essay writing ones definitely are like that, right? Okay. The essay okay. ones and the essay competitions. This is where now I can invite more of academia to offer um, a, a panel to look at some of these essays. You know, th these are an opportunity for us to engage with the emeritus groups. And you know, for example, I was working with. Stephen Tubinek, again, I mentioned his name before, yeah. and he had said that there's a huge and growing, especially in Canada, of emeritus professors that have been put out to pasture, so to speak, but are like brilliant, right? They're just, they're not mm. teaching anymore, but they're still researching and learning and reading, and they've had a lifetime of, of, of teaching and researching uh, in the humanities, and they're like, you know, prime for that. So um, going back to where you said about how in you know, having to grow Planksip, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I, I probably wouldn't say no to an angel sort of cash infusion, but the problem is, is I don't really need it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even, even my, um, even the funds that I would get in order to grow it to 10,000, I was only looking for 300 K because I just wanted to get the right people in place to almost be like salespeople to be able to really get that, this message. That tends to be a good use of funds. Like, so if you go to an angel investment group and you say, hey, we want 300,000, they'll be like, well, what are you going to do with it? And if it's yeah. like, well, we want to hire people to sell it, it has to be kind of, that's pretty good if you have something like software as a service that you can sell. And it's mm -hmm. pretty clear what you're like, who you're selling it to and what. And it's like, okay, there's a pretty good model there because yeah. then it's like, okay, we put in 300,000, the thing's valued at, let's say 3 million or whatever. You know, they take 10%, you keep 90% of it. And then from there you grow it. And then you can take it from there to an angel to a, sorry, a venture capital. And then they'll, you know, take it to like the next level, like this sort of 20 million valuation or whatever. Right. So you kind of like scaffold it and build it up. But part of it is also like, where do you see the exit being? And that's typically not with an initial public offering. That's typically somebody buys you like some yeah. competitor buys you or something. So it's kind of like, once you go down that road, 
you're sort of saying like, yeah, I'm actually planning to, especially in Canada, I'm planning to like sell this to somebody eventually, which if yeah. you're not really looking to do, it's kind of like, then the investor's like, well, what's your exit strategy? It's like, well, I don't really have one. It's like, huh, I'm not really sure I'm going to get my money back then. Well, it was, it was more, um, you know, once we had, like, say, for example, we had a viable model where we had, you know, the 10,000 and it's on an isolated media outlet. And we have this new form of engagement, uh, you know, all of the things that we were talking about, right. And more, right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then we can say to another media outlet, and there's a plenty of them, there's like thousands and thousands of them to say, this model really works. It changes what engagement means. It actually involves people in a community to do things other than like, follow, or, you know, put yeah. a comment on your, yeah, you know, yeah. on your material, right. It actually gets them involved creating yeah, stuff, yeah. right. And building them up. Right. So, yeah, so I think what you could do is you could say like, you want to keep your community and make it special and do it. And like, absolutely hundred percent. Exactly. But take, if there's some pieces of the technology, you can say like, Hey, these could be reused because they're already solving a problem here. Yeah. That's something. And that's the sort of thing you could spin out into some sort of like startup and get angel investing is if you're like, okay, the technology we have, this thing is already solving this problem. And yeah. here's someone else who has that problem. So that's the sort of thing where it's kind of like taking a look at the sort of disaggregating what you have and not, not necessarily saying like, I'm going to replicate this whole community, but like, I have this, you know, like, I, I don't know that you've mentioned a few different things. And it's kind of just going through the different, you know, pieces of a technology yeah. and sort of seeing what's the most appropriate to kind of package up in a certain way. And it's great to go really, really micro-focused and be like, this thing is specifically for, you know, individual writers, or this yeah. is for, you know, professors or like whatever it is you think the target market is and just like really understand that clearly. Yeah. And I, I so what I'm hearing from you is actually reaffirming my um i guess my initial assumptions of i i should just take it myself and 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 run it as a as a private equity com company mostly right so, I mean, so, we, so a model that would work well would be a venture studio where actually okay. you get in seasoned entrepreneurs so you bring in so venture studio brings in seasoned entrepreneurs you have some money and then you have some a team that like comes up with ideas and stuff like that and then you kill right. most of the ideas because they generally suck. But yeah. you know, there's a process by it. But then with the working with the entrepreneur, you actually have, you know, sort of doing the starting to implement the ideas and doing the market research and sort of finding out like, does this thing work? And then they actually are the you sort of become the CEO and founder. And you as the venture studio have a stake in that. But your stake oh, okay. came really, really early. So it was like sort of cheap in a way compared to like venture capital. I would love later. to do a venture studio because that's yeah. now what yeah. Blank Sip offers. And that's yes. my position of the founder to tell them what the vision is. And we're always friends and give me a call and my stake yeah. is small. And it just, And then yeah, you, totally. you help take them and you provide a deal, deal flow to angel investment groups because they're looking for an entrepreneur who has a good idea and there's a good team and they've got some traction, they've got some paying customers. And it's like, okay, if I put some money into this, this will help them get to the point that, you know, venture capitalists getting get involved. And then eventually it gets big enough and there's a big exit there. Everybody makes money, right? Like everybody loves it when there's a big exit, right? So yeah. that model can work and we just need to like build that structure and make it happen. So if you already have something that's profitable and you've got sort of um, cash flows from it, then it's like, okay, you could reinvest those cash flows in building sort of startups, like finding seasoned entrepreneurs and building a team around them and then just spinning that out. You could also take your cash flow. And if you're an accredited investor, which you probably would be, like just get involved in an angel investment group. And then you'd have entrepreneurs come and you could like, you know, learn how to evaluate what they're doing and then be like, yeah, I'm going to invest in you or not kind of thing. There's tons well, of ways funny. to do this. I really only the number I have in my head is three hundred thousand, and if you if you think about it, it's not a lot of salaries, right? Like, I mean, anybody with a, a, a like a postgraduate sort of, you know, I mean, I'm like I would be done. Right? What's, like, that, what's that? Sorry, I cut out there for a second. So, so if I have a, if I have a uh, if I'm trying to raise three hundred thousand dollars, and that on six people. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> salaries and expenses and all this kind of thing easily spend that on six people. So it's almost like it's easier for me to re reverse engineer the 10,000 subscribers because it's not hundreds of thousands of subscribers than it would be to. So I'm actually really close to doing that. In fact, um, I just, uh, 
and it's probably easier for me to do it myself. On, on, honestly, just yeah, just to yeah. kind of go in a different way. Yeah, yeah. The reason is is because I have a little bit more experience in that. My last company that I sold was in 2016, and it was in the architectural industry. Okay. Right. Right. And um, I brought on two partners, and then I phased out of it. So I had my exit, and I had my buyout, and I had so. I was the inventor of the company. I was the founder. I built it up. I exited. And for the $300,000, it's almost not worth trying to gear it to pitch it to, you, you know what I mean? Like yeah, all of yeah. that. It's, like if you have something that's working. It, yeah. Just like keep building the thing it, you're, you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because so. the thing is, like the, the value of going outside is, yes, there's the money. And that's a lot of entrepreneurs don't have money, so they have to go outside. But the thing that it also brings you, it can bring you sort of the strategic investors. So like you bring this person in, they have money, but they also have amazing connections and stuff like that, which is fantastic. But if that's you already right, yeah. have money and you have also have amazing connections or whatever, like what are you giving up a piece of like what you're Anything doing for, for right? Because like the, the only other thing that it would provide is sort of validation that you're not doing something completely bonkers, right? Because yeah. you know, for somebody to hand over like a check of twenty five thousand, they'd have to be pretty convinced that what you're doing actually makes some sense. So it can be useful in that yeah. regard, right? But if you're like, you know, already have something, you have paying customers, you know, and you have like connections and stuff like that, and you already think like, yeah, this seems like a reasonably good, then that's just a question of like, what would you need to like build this further to go from like 50 saying 57 paying customers to like you know 60 or something or 100 or whatever like what's the you know and part of that's talk to your 57 paying customers and sort of find out like you know what like what like almost like what, like what is it that what's the value they're getting out of it because it might not be the value that you think you're providing right yeah it might be yeah. some other reason yeah, and 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 those fifty-seven represent a journey from you know George Van or George Gantz was my first um, yearly subscriber. Nice. Right? I mean, nice. it was all monthly, but George is like, I'm signing up for a year. I'm like, okay, George, we're gonna yeah. yeah. So we created content together, and um, it it was uh, you know a full year of a project called consciousness and consilience and you know now we're taking it to uh you know publish the transcripts so very personalized well, what do you want to do right george what's right for his his uh media outlet is um spiral inquiry I mean, pretty yeah. much just him yeah. on there yeah but he's got this unique um network of boston long now with you and passionate about and that intersection between spirituality, particularly religion and yeah. and uh, science. So, you know, he's interesting and he's authentic and he's trying to. He's got great connections. The guy he knows in Toronto is mm -hmm. Eric Boyd, who was the interim managing director of Maple Leaf Angels. Like I'm on calls with Eric like every week looking at, you know, startups found. He's part of the investment review committee, I think, with Maple Leaf Angels. The guy's amazing. And so yeah. George, he and George knows him and stuff like that. So it's like, if you can get more Georges, that's yeah. awesome. It's just like, keep building that. And then like George, you know, it's like, hey, George, how'd you get to be so amazing at this stuff? And it's like, oh, it was all about plank sip. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you provide so much value that people are like feeding things back into your ecosystem or whatever, right? Yeah, so definitely that's kind of the approach. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, Somebody told me, and I had the epiphany that that ten thousand subscribers. Again, I've said it before earlier in the show, but it's not like half a million subscribers. It's like you, your company would be so different. My company would be so different with half a million subscribers. I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like. Right? Yeah. I yeah. I really can't because logistically, I don't know how I would accommodate well, it's, that. It's interesting because the price point you have is high for like a consumer yeah. thing, but low for a business thing. So yeah. it's, it's you're, you're sort of in this weird middle ground where a lot of people were looking at a consumer and be like, eh, I'm not paying a hundred bucks a month because Netflix is only whatever, 15, 20 bucks a month, <laughs> but it's yeah. not a Netflix thing. And then it's like for a company, like you said, they pay three, $4,000 for this stuff. And it's like, oh, that's so, so it's sort of in this weird middle ground where like the only thing I have that like is e of equal cost of that is actually a membership in Maple Leaf Angels. To be an angel investor costs, you know, well, it was 1200. It's more like 1500 a year it's going up to, but it's the sort of thing where like, 
I wonder if like there's a way of like looking at other things that are sort of in that price range, like the, you know, 80 to $200 a month, like people's gym memberships. Like I have no idea. I don't go to the gym. Like, are, is that like a 50 buck a month thing? I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Um, okay. it, it, that's a good point to see what else is out there, but I, you know, so much of the product that we produce in terms of long form discussion, this type of thing happens in just a, a long form discussion. So what yeah. I'm hoping the best way is a very organic way of explaining something. And then someone saying, yeah, I'll give that a shot. I want to be a contributing writer for Plank Sip. I want to be able to, you know, do all the stuff and be associated with this and have that group of talented people, um, you know, be involved with my content creation strategy. Right. And yeah, yeah. so, so they sign up, they're part of it. You know, we promote from within. So if we're hiring somebody and we need some editorial help or, you know, anything like that, you know, we promote those people because they've already bought into the concept. So I always try and explain that Plank Sip is just like uh, another media outlet. Imagine Guardian decided to have several type of like engage different engagement strategies with people. Right. And mm -hmm. all the people that would say, Oh fuck! I'm writing for I write for Guardian, or I write for the Atlantic, or I write right, for this right. that. Okay. The Plank Sip brand doesn't have that same equity yet, but it it can and it will, especially if it can you know really kind of um, get to the goal that we need to go. And 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 the reason That's why I think this is yeah, yeah this is really cha uh, can change the industry is because imagine there's a topic that came up and we had ten thousand writers and. Let's just say that you and I are at the helm of that, okay? Right? And we say, here's an important topic. 10,000 writers, we need to descend on this. Like a swarm, 10,000 writers write and submit, and uh, should, you know. We should try this out. We oof. should pick something. We should pick just, something and just give it a whirl, right? Yeah. You just, you have, you have this like swell of writers that just, that, that, that swarm around something. Yeah. So, so if they're on here's Twitter, an idea the effective altruism forum we could go post stuff on there um you'd have to like sign up and stuff like that but um if you can and maybe not ten thousand articles on there but if you post a handful of articles on there around a theme or whatever it can be pretty good it can get some attention the other thing to do would be even not necessarily on that platform but just overall wherever on the internet post stuff about existential risk because that's huge in the effective altruism sort of community. So if it's like we have this conjure of writers who are going to write really, really good stuff about existential risk, then it like really sets that as like, hey, this is the place to go. Um, the other thing is like there are people who do, I guess, the writing, and it's not necessarily their own content they're writing. They're like helping somebody else. So somebody else has sort of the ideas, and then they work with sort of the writer to kind of like you know, help turn that into something like I am like terrible at writing basically, mm. but I could probably like just have a discussion with somebody like you. And if you're amazing at writing, you could probably just go and like based on a discussion be like, oh, cool, let me write this thing down and be like, okay, awesome. And then like, you know, so like there's lots of ways you could make this kind of come together in terms of like just how you create the content. So well, you know, I should probably yeah. go. It's like 6.20 okay, yeah. and I gotta get some food, but this has been awesome. We will yep. see if what the recording looks like. I will send it to you and hopefully it, it worked okay. All right. And then I'll try and put together my first, my guess at how the thing would come together, right? Like yeah, intro yeah. and, and background and stuff like that. And, you know, let me, th let me put something together and then we'll, like you say, iterate. <laughs> yes. I love it. Yeah. Sounds All good. Right. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye.